Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's Canada C3 Hangout. Uh, my name is Joe Grabowski. I'll be your host for today. For a little bit of background for those who are maybe unfamiliar, the Canada C3 is a signature project for Canada's 150th anniversary. And the centerpiece is an epic 150-day sailing journey from Toronto to Victoria via the Northwest Passage uh, to connect Canadians from coast to coast to coast and inspire a deeper understanding of our land, our peoples, and the past, present, and future uh, of our country. So the expeditions divide into 15 legs and we'll have a cross-section of Canadians on board from scientists to artists to Indigenous lead, uh, elders to historians, community leaders, youth journalists and educators. Um, very excited today to be joined, I believe we're on leg 12 now in the Pacific Ocean off of Alaska, to be joined by Mark Edwards. He's a research scientist and curator of mammalogy at the Royal Alberta Museum in Edmonton. His research is land-based with a focus on large mammals living in natural as well as urban areas in the Arctic and the Arctic uh, regions. And he's researching individuals and populations to understand uh, how they distribute themselves, how they use resources, their behaviors and interactions with each other. So Mark, it's so great to have you joining us from the C3 today. Fantastic to be here. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, we've got you coming in loud and clear. Great, great. Yeah, so um, as was just said, I'm one of the members of the science team here on Canada C3 and uh, leg 12 of this epic journey. Um, we started our, I got on board in Tuktoyaktuk and we've sailed all the way around Alaska. We've actually just left U.S. waters and entered into Canadian waters and we're on our way now to uh, Prince Rupert. Um, so yeah, it was mentioned that I, I should say that we started this on the bridge, uh, what we had to move inside um, uh, into a different room because right now the seas are very, very rough um, and we're kind of getting tossed around a little bit. Uh, I can show that picture sort of out the window in a little bit once I've uh, had a chance to tell you a little bit about what we're doing here. Um, so as mentioned, I'm the Curator of Mammals at the uh, Royal Alber Alberta Museum. And just, can't, I can't see everybody there, but I wanted to make sure everyone was sort of on the same page and get a sense that know what mammals are. That's what I, I study. Uh, so there's five different uh, characteristics for mammals. Um, oh yeah, I can see some people there. That's great. Hi everyone. Um, oh good, they're waving. They're waving. That's great. Um, so yeah, so there's five characteristics to mammals. And maybe I could see a show of hands of anybody who knows what a mammal is. Fantastic. That's awesome. Yeah, so... Hey, Mark, I see some hands. We can pick on some classrooms if you want, see if maybe they can pick out a couple. Oh, that'd be great. That'd be fantastic. Yeah, so can someone say, can someone say one of the characteristics of being a mammal? All right, Mr. Keller's class, I see lots of hands, so let's turn your microphone on. Do you have a characteristic? Mammals are warm-blooded animals. Can you say that louder? Mammals are warm-blooded animals. Yes, that's great. Um, yeah, I always kind of say, if you take your hands and you put them under your arms like this, you can see me, you get kind of warm there, it takes a little bit, but yeah. Mammals are warm-blooded. Can anyone with another characteristic? All right, let's jump to Mrs. King's group and see if they have a characteristic. Lauren, go ahead. Okay, go ahead, Lauren. Uh, mammals give um, living birth. Live birth. Yes. 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 Mammals have live births, and mammals, all mammal babies, get milk from their mommies. That's great. Can we have another one? All right, let's check our other class in Waterloo. Uh, with Mrs. Carr, your microphone's on. Okay. Okay. Well, most mammals don't lay eggs. Very good. Very good. And another one. Do you guys have another one there? Another one. No. No. I think that's it. Because ours were taken. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Let's uh, hop over to the Canadian Museum of Nature. I see there's a couple watching the, the presentation. Let's see if anyone in the audience knows. They, they don't want to be on the mic, but mammals have hair. Yes, that's right. Some mammals have more than others. 
<laughs> Fair enough. And the other thing that mammals have, if you reach all the way back and you feel that kind of bony thing in your back, your backbone. All mammals have a backbone. Excellent. Well, I think the classrooms did pretty good for being put on the spot. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, so yeah, as was mentioned, I, I, I'm the curator of mammals at a museum, and some of you are at a museum, which is fantastic. Museums, as you know, have all these great galleries where you can go and see fantastic things and learn all sorts of cool stuff. But the other thing that museums have is they got stuff in the back that not a lot of people see, and those are collections. And museums do a great job of collecting things. They are the ultimate hoarders. Um, and they do it in such a way that allows for people just like you, uh, students and teachers and other scientists at the Royal Alberta Museum, I get artists and writers coming in to see our collections so they can get really close to either a, a human history artifact or a natural history specimen, those sorts of things. And one of the things that we're doing as part of the science team here on Canada C3 is we are doing collections in Canada. that we're going to this route coastal areas from coast to coast, different spots along that we are doing collections. I call that like a mega transect and a mega transect allows us to collect things in a certain way. We're collecting water samples, um, but we're doing, and we're measuring temperature and salinity and, and pressure. Uh, we're collecting plants, terrestrial plants. We're also um, recording birds and mammal observations all along this this coast to coast to coast route and that's one of the great benefits and why we're doing this on Canada C3 is we're providing a baseline and this baseline understanding now is so that in the future with stuff like climate change happening and changes in species ranges moving up moving north or moving south just changing we'll be able to measure that against that baseline um, yeah, and one of the other things about that is that each of the Canada C3 scientists has another project that they're working on. And I'm working on a project that's related to mammals. Uh, and my project actually started a number of years ago, and Canada C3 just allowed me the opportunity to go even more in depth. And about 2003, I started working on a really, really cool mammal in the Northwest Territories, just south of the Beaufort Sea, uh, in a place called the Anubial Settlement Region. I started working on grizzly bears. Does anyone like grizzly bears there? I see lots of hands. Yeah, that, that's always my reaction too. Um, what was happening in 2003 is there was a lot of interest in developing the area for oil and gas extraction with the idea of taking that oil and gas and bringing it to southern markets. But there was also a lot of concern from local people about the effects that that might have on some of the wildlife, caribou uh, and grizzly bears in particular, because they are very important to the communities up there. So I was asked to go up and look at this and provide a baseline understanding of grizzly bear ecology. And we did that by catching grizzly bears. We give them a little collar. Uh, it's a little necklace that they can show their friends. Uh, it records where uh, they've been and what they're doing. And then they send me an email every day, a text message saying where, where they've been and what they're doing. Now, with that information, we were also looking at the importance of different habitats for them their diet, uh, where they were going, how they were moving around the landscape. And with that movement, one of the questions, it's kind of a side project, was going out on the sea ice. And the reason for that question was because hunters in the area, local people in the area, were starting to see grizzly bears in strange places, uh, out on the sea ice, on some of the Arctic islands, where they hadn't been seen in a long time, if and in some time never seen there before. So over the next few years, I monitored and watched my grizzly bears move around the landscape, wondering if one of them would go out on the sea ice. 2003, 2004, 2005. None of my bears went out on the sea ice. So what would that mean? I'm not sure. But then in 2006, 
um, some lo a hunter with some local guides. They were out off the coast of Saks Harbor uh, in the Beaufort Sea, and they shot uh, a polar bear. They were polar bear hunting, and they shot a polar bear. And when they went closer to it, it looked really strange. They had kind of a longer uh, skull shape so that they can get their head right down into that seal hole and pull that seal out. This one had a broader head um, and kind of had dark patches around its eyes, so not the white fur of a polar bear. And its fur was kind of a yellowy brown. And then when they looked at the claws, grizzly bears have these nice long claws. Polar bears have kind of shorter, sharp claws. And it was kind of, kind of in between. And so what were they looking at? They weren't really sure. Further tests would show that this was actually uh, a hybrid. It was a polar bear, uh, grizzly bear hybrid. And further tests would show that dad was a grizzly bear and mom was a polar bear. So obviously grizzly bears were going on the sea ice even though none of my bears had gone out. But was this just a happenstance? Was it just an anomaly? Well, that was the question. And so who knows? But then a couple of years later, another hybrid was shot. And this one turned out to have, dad was a grizzly bear and mom was a hybrid. So we know now that there's at least one more hybrid out there. So this brings me to my little project on Canada C3. And that is to look at local observations of the interactions between these two parent species. So grizzly bears and polar bears and potentially hybrids. So are people on the land and out in the sea ice seeing more of this? And what do they think about that in terms of a changing Arctic related to say climate change or other natural and um, human related um, factors? So that's kind of what I've been doing. I've been going to the different communities. I was talking to people in Herschel Island and Tuktoyaktuk as well as Tikiak and Nome about these uh, different issues and getting their perspectives on what they think is happening and how that what is that important to them uh, is it just something that's happened how they're dealing with these changes in the Arctic Thanks. all right so so far on the journey um, how long have you been on the boat so far uh, a few weeks I've been on I just I mark it every day uh, this is day 17 on the ship. All right, and you still have many more to come, I hope. Yeah, we've got three or four more days All right, before the excellent. end of leg 12. Excellent. I'm not sure if anyone's actually ready to leave yet. It's been such a great experience. Oh, no, I can imagine. It's, uh, it's a beautiful ship, and I got to check it out uh, in Toronto. So I can only imagine you're having a ton of fun out at sea. Yes. So have you uh, observed any bears of either species in your time on the ship so far? No, we actually, when we were in off the coast of Alaska, we actually went to Kodiak Island. And if anybody knows, Kodiak has this big, big grizzly bears. Um, they are, some of these bears can get up to about 1,300 pounds. Um, uh, so they're really big bears, uh, but, uh, and these are the salmon fed bears. So you'll find these bears along salmon streams. Uh, they'll eat other things like they eat mice. Um, they'll eat a lot of berries, but uh, talking to people in Kodiak, they're saying that this year there was a late frost and a lot of the berries, instead of having all the nutrition go into the berries, the plants actually suck that nutrition back into their root system to produce more growth. So that meant that the bears were all mostly down feeding on salmon. But we're kind of getting late in the season. We thought we might find a couple of bears maybe at some of the uh, stream entrances, river entrances. And we searched really hard, um, but we never saw any bears, unfortunately. We tried hard though. All right, so the hybrids that you're talking about between the, the polar bears and the grizzlies, I've heard them referred to as pizzly bears. And I've also heard them referred to yes. as growler bears. Do you have a preference? Um, well, the actual official name for them is sort of polar bear, grizzly bear, Ursus maritimus and Ursus uh, arctos. Those are the scientific names for those two species. 
Um, but really, we Pisley is kind of more the preferred common name. And the reason why is that it's because mom was a polar bear and dad was a grizzly bear. If it had been the other way around, it could be possible that the common name might end up um, uh, Groller bear. And then there's also, uh, in a Nuvialuit, uh, Nuvialuit settlement region, they call the, the polar bear Nanook, and then the Gwich'in call um, grizzly bears Aklak, and so there's Ninalak is another word for them. But Pisley is kind of the um, unfortunate name for this hybrid. Gotcha. All right. Well, I've got some questions coming in already, so let's meet some of um, our classrooms. Uh, our first group just sent me a question. They're grade 10 students in Priestville, Canada, and they sent it to me via the text. So they're wondering, um, how did you become interested in researching bears in the first place? Uh, can you repeat the question? Uh, yeah. How did you become interested in researching bears uh, to begin with? Oh, okay. No, that's a great question. Um, I've always been interested in, in mammals. Uh, I grew up on the sort of edge of town where my backyard was, was forest and fields, and um, I caught small mammals when I was a kid. Uh, and then when I got older, I started to get interested in uh, carnivores in particular. I worked on weasels before, uh, so ermine, little, little weasels, and then had the opportunity to work on larger mammals like, um, like grizzly bears. And my, my interest comes really because they're, they're just a really interesting, interesting animal. This is an animal that has a long learning period uh, with its mom. Cubs will stay with, its, with their mom for about you know, two to three years, depending, depending on the area. Um, they move around the landscape. They have a really interesting way of dealing with harsh conditions because they hibernate. That's a period of, and when, during the winter when there's not a lot of food, so there's that component to them. So they're just a really interesting animal to study. There's always new questions to ask about them. All right, so let's meet our next classroom. So joining us from Waterloo, uh, Ontario in Canada, we have Mr. Keller's grade three, four classroom. I'll turn your microphone on and you can ask a question. I have a question. Okay. Um, Esme, what do you got? Forget? Okay. Taylor, choose one. Okay, quick, quick. Where do you stay overnight? Oh. So are you on the boat full time or are you staying somewhere else ah. when you're on the expedition? Ah, so where do where do we stay? Yes, we're on the boat. We stay on the boat all the time. Um, and interestingly enough about leg 12 is of all the legs, this is the one that has the most number of sea days. So we've had a number of days, three, four days that have gone by where we've been completely at sea. Uh, we can't see land at all, totally um, in the middle of the ocean. Um, and during that time where we always, we have tight quarters, uh, we share a room with a roommate. Uh, we have bunk beds, which is really cool. Uh, I ended up on the bottom bunk. Um, and it's got, you know, it's got a little bit. All right, Mark, we just lost you. You were just telling us about you had the bottom bunk and then you cut out a little bit with the connection. What's that? Mark, can you the last me? question. Yes, I can. Okay, sorry, we, we lost you for part of the answer. You, you told us you had the bottom bunk and then we lost you a little bit. Okay, all right, well, I'll, I'll try and answer again are you hearing me now yes yep okay yes so we um as i said we stay on on the ship that's our, our home during during leg 12. uh we've had uh we have a small room where we share roommate we have bunk beds um we do everything on the ship really we have bathrooms and we have our showers on the ship uh, we have a cafe or a cafeteria on the ship where we get our food fantastic food we eat really well almost too much. Um, um, it's actually quite comfortable. 
All right, let's meet our next classroom there in Waterloo as well. Um, Mrs. Uh, Carr's group and their grade three, four classroom. Let me turn your microphone on because I know you have a question because you just sent me one, but you can ask it live. Okay. Um, on, can you go swimming in the ocean? Yes, that's a good question. Um, we can go we on swimming, or at least some of us, um, in the ocean. It's very, very cold. Uh, I did not go swimming, but one of the participants did go swimming. Um, um, because I'm doing a lot of the collections of seawater, I get just about as wet as if I did go swimming. All right, and that same grade three, four classroom had sent me in a question via the text, and they were wondering if you knew approximately um, what the population of polar bears is um, globally. Uh, I believe it's about 2,000. Okay, our next classroom is joining us from Canada, uh, Ontario. Their microphone's on. Uh, with Mrs. King, and they're a grade six classroom. Um, has anyone tried to breed, keep breeding the um, grizzly polar bears? Can you repeat the first part? Has anyone, has anyone tried, tried to um, continue breeding the grizzly polar bears? Breeding? Yeah, I think she's wondering if there's been any effort to to keep them breeding, maybe intentionally. Oh, okay. Um, not in recent years. Um, many, many years ago, I uh, tried to breed grizzly bear and polar bear uh, more for interest sake, but um, not so much now. Uh, the grizzly, the, the hybrids that we're seeing right now are all wild uh, born. It's all just a wild occurrence that has happened. All right, and let's jump to Ottawa, Ontario with the Canadian Museum of Nature. Um, how is everyone doing today? Oh, we're doing just great. Thank you. Nice to see you all. And uh, hi there on the ship. Um, we have a question hi. about the range of grizzly bears. Since you have started studying grizzly bears, has their northern extent of the range changed? Has the northern extent of their range changed? Yes. Has well, not, not exactly. Um, in the past, um, we've seen grizzly bears. So at, in the Northwest Territories, uh, where I did my research, um, Grizzly bears, that is the northern extent of their range. And we do know that for most species that at their range limits, uh, we'll often see sort of excursions by different animals. Now, does that represent uh, range expansion? Not necessarily. Animals will move out into different areas and then come back um, until we actually have what we would call sort of a resident population in a new area. So for example, if we had grizzly bears moving further east or moving up onto say Victoria or Banks Island and we were seeing full family groups over a number of years, uh, then we might consider that that would be a range expansion. But you have to remember that an animal like a grizzly bear that can live into its late 20s um, will have cubs only every three to four years once it reaches uh, adulthood it might take a long time for a population of grizzlies to be established in an area. And it could just as easily be one animal um, that people are seeing, and that animal might end up moving back onto mainland or where it came from. Um, so it would take a little bit before we would actually sort of conclusively say that we see a range expansion. All right, well, Mark, before we jump back to our live groups, um, I know you mentioned it was rough conditions today. Are you able to try and yes. show us maybe out the the porthole? Yes. Yeah, for sure. Just give me a second here. 
if I can stand up. All right, I don't know if we can see this. Can you see out there? Yeah, I can see the waves breaking against the, the ship. Yeah, we just, bef yeah, you can see a big one there. There we go. Definitely, it doesn't look like it'd be too, too much fun to be on deck right now. No, we've got a lot of water that's splashing over the deck right now. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a little rough out there. Things are kind of sliding around. All right, and Mark, I just had a message come through Facebook from the Royal Alberta Museum, and they're excited about uh, the Hangout, and they're looking forward to getting the video link to share afterwards, so I will pass it along to them uh, when we finish today. All I'm right. Royal Alberta Museum. Excellent. Um, so Mrs. Patterson's class, the grade 10s, they sent me in another question. And they're wondering if polar bears maybe continue to move um, southward, maybe due to loss of sea ice, do you think it's possible we could lose the polar bear species if they keep uh, interbreeding with grizzly bears? Um, no, not really. Um, polar bears are really, they're real special. Uh, sea ice is their, their habitat. So all species have different habitats. And for polar bears, although they walk on the ice, they're really a marine mammal. Um, they need that ice platform to hunt from. Um, some of the females will have their dens out on the sea ice. And so it's really that annual ice, that pack ice, that is the most productive. That is where we'll find seals. It, th that ice allows for seals to make their breeding holes. It allows for polar bears to hunt them there. Um, ring seals will breed, uh, make their birthing layers on the sea ice. So polar bears really need that high uh, fat diet. And that's what like a ring seal or even a bearded seal provides them with. Polar bears really can't survive um, on a diet of berries like say a grizzly bear does. Um, they really do need that high fat content in their diet to survive. So I don't think we'll see, every now and then, like I said before, we'll see animals moving into different areas, but they may be just kind of exploring. They may catch a scent and they'll move a little further inland to do that, but really it's the sea ice that is their home. Okay, so the hybrids we're likely seeing are probably maybe not really signs of global warming, but more just kind of bears exploring a little bit more. Maybe some um, rogue individuals. Yeah, one of the things that um, that kind of happens, that I guess that we've been able to discern is that when we have these sort of climatic fluctuations, these periods of climate change, we will get movements of different animals. And sort of historically speaking, when we look at grizzly bear and polar bear range expansion, expansion and contraction, they kind of work in opposites. When um, the climate is, is warmer, we'll get one of them expanding. When it cools, we'll get another one expanding. And periods, we'll often see these different uh, species coming into contact and then moving further apart. So it could be that what we're seeing right now is one of those occasions. All right. So I just had a question come in via Facebook from a grade three, four classroom who's watching live on Facebook. They are uh, from Picton, Ontario, and they're wondering, uh, do you like it on the boat? Was there a period of adjustment when you first got on? Um, I actually really like it on the boat. Um, it's, uh, I find that when I'm, when I'm going to sleep at night, it's kind of like rocking in a cradle. It kind of rocks you back and forth. Um, I had one day where I wasn't feeling very well. Um, other people have had a harder time. Some people have been absolutely fine. Um, but it's, uh, it's a, it's a neat experience. I've always wanted to experience being on a icebreaker and that's what we're on here. Uh, so it's been, it's been really fun. All right. Mr. Keller's class, do you guys have another question about uh, the journey so far or maybe grizzly or polar bears? There we go. 
Did you see any other animals? In Did you see any other animals? Did you get that, Mark? They're wondering if you saw what kind of other animals. I think I got it. that. Yeah. Yes, we've been, uh, which are really cool, northern sea otters. We've seen uh, stellar sea lions in Alaska. We had a great opportunity to see uh, humpback whales. Walrus. All right, sounds like a great selection of Arctic animals. I uh, personally love every time I get to see humpback whales, so that's pretty cool. Uh, another question. Let's yeah, they, we were cool. actually. Oh, oh, sorry, go ahead, Mark. Go on. I was going to jump oh, to I was just going to say, um, oh, okay, that's great. Let's do that. Okay. Uh, Mrs. Uh, Core's grade three fours uh, in Waterloo. Your microphone's on. Hi, hi Wazzy. Uh, like, well, uh, Hi. Uh, like, like when it bites its prey, how much like does it like has like the pounds of like pressure on it, like the pressure is on the prey. Oh, like um, pounds of pressure in its bite. Yeah, with the bite, and he's also wants to. He's wondering how big can it open its mouth. Ah. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, um, and that's for bears in general or polar bear, grizzly bear? I didn't hear. He was wondering about the grizzly bear. Ah, okay. Um, well, I don't, I don't actually know what the pound You kind of get there. If you kind of put your hand over your head like this, that's kind of how far, how far they can bite. And it's the same thing for polar bears. Now, your head is about the same size of a seal. And if you kind of bring your fingers down along the side to your ears, that, yeah, that's probably about the size of a polar bear bite because you can just grab a seal and pull them right out. Okay. Well, I for one hope that I never experience something like that. That's quite a that's quite a radius that they can they can reach around. Uh, let's jump to Mrs. King's class in Canada. Your microphone's on. Okay. Approximately how big is a Kodiak bear? Ah, very good question. Um, so Kodiak bears are the biggest um, well, they're the biggest land bears. They're actually the biggest land carnivore in the world. And they are almost about the same size as a polar bear. Can average out to be about 1,300 pounds. I'm not sure what that is in kilograms. And a few about uh, 600, 700 pounds. But they can actually get much bigger than that as well almost close to 2,000 pounds, about 1,300 pounds for the males. So very big animals. Well, and they you. get that way because they've got they have this continuous uh, to eat from the time they come out of the den. The salmon start running in July, goes all, all the way to September. And then, then they go. back in the den in November. All right. I bet you we could weigh some of those classrooms of grade three, four students, and they might not even weigh as much as a full grown Kodiak or polar bear. That's pretty impressive. All right. Back to the Canadian Museum of Nature. Your microphone's on if you guys have another question. Hi there. I'm just curious about the ship itself. I don't know if anybody's asked about that, but can you tell me a bit about the ship you're on? Catch that. Did you get We're that? We're having a little bit of internet difficulty. Yeah. 
he's he's wondering if you can tell uh, them a little bit about the C3 ship in general, the expedition ship. Hey, so um, I believe that it was a Coast Guard ship at one time. It's borrowed from the Coast Guard. Um, so it has a very, very thick hull, and it has, actually it has four engines that it can run on two engines. And the design of the ship is such that it can push through, push through the ice. We actually were talking to the captain yesterday about just that exact thing. Um, then one of the other things that's really great about this ship is we actually can process seawater uh, to for drinking water it, for our sewage and everything like that on board the ship. Uh, so it's a pretty remarkable uh, machine. All right, and I have one more question coming from our class in Picton. They just sent it to me via Facebook. And they're wondering, polar bears, do they dig their own dens or do they find um, them already? Uh, I didn't catch the first part. Is that grizzly bears or polar bears? Uh, the polar bears. Polar bears. Okay, so polar bears, only the females really den, and they only den for a short period just to get out of that harsh weather conditions and to have their, their cubs. But they will dig new dens. Uh, they, they, may, uh, they have a high level of fidelity, so they go back to the same areas to den, but each time they will dig a, do, a new den. Some polar bears will actually den out on sea ice, um, but oftentimes they'll come on land for that. All right. Well, that's that's fascinating to me. I never, I, I knew polar bears made dens, but I never thought of it being on the sea ice. So that's a that's a pretty cool fact that they'll den right on the sea ice. Um, let's see. So the great tens have sent me another question, and they're wondering. Um, about your encounters in the past. Have you ever had a bear encounter? Hmm. Uh, I've had one bear encounter. Uh, this was with a black bear, and this was in northern New Brunswick when I was doing um, some work there. And I was doing a, a transect. Uh, this was a vegetation transect and small mammal trapping transect. And I had a bear, black bear following me along that transect at one time. Um, he was, this was an area that had lots of hills and I could see the black bear on the hill behind me and as I moved up the hill it was still behind me. Uh, luckily I had a, a, a metal clipboard with me and I was banging against the tree and banging against the tree and eventually the black bear looked up and actually saw me and he ran away. But that's been my only encounter with a bear outside of actually studying them. All right. And then, Mark, what are some techniques you would use um, to study the bears? Uh, things like radio tracking or collaring? Yeah, we use um, a variety of techniques to learn about mammals in general. And uh, we may catch a bear and put a collar on them uh, to learn about where they're moving around to what habitats are important to them, what areas are important to them. Um, and then we do other th things as well. We don't actually, uh, we can collect samples of blood, um, maybe fat. And this can tell us information about they're eating, um, how healthy they are, whether they have any types of diseases or anything like that. Um, Actually, sometimes we'll be able to go actually and work within museum collections on some of the specimens that they've had, whether they're cranial specimens like um, skull or postcranial sort of skeletal material, doing morphological information, so measuring or actually taking little bits of bone and finding out about the entire lifetime diet of that animal. So there's lots of different ways that we study uh, grizzly bears, polar bears, and other animals. All right, and a popular question that usually comes in is just come in online. And we have a class wondering what kind of things they should study if they want to get into maybe something like wildlife biology. 
Um, yeah, it's a great question. One of the things that's happening a lot now with biology uh, that a lot of people don't know is we're doing a lot more models in, in, in ecology. And by models, I mean we're taking a bunch of information that we've collected from animals and we're putting them into computer programs. So math is really important. Um, a lot of things that's happening in schools now is there's coding that people are doing. So learning how to do computer code. I know that there's coding clubs and that sort of thing. So those are really things that are advancing biology right now. All right, and it looks like Mr. Keller's class in Waterloo wants to put you on the spot and find out oh, which well. bear do you find more interesting, the grizzly or the polar bear? Oh no, that's a hard question. Um, oh. I like them both, but I think probably the grizzly bear. Just a little more, just a little bit more. Uh, Mark, sorry, there was a little internet blink right at the type of bear. We got blank bear. What type of bear was it? Okay, grizzly bear. Grizzly bear, all right. Fair enough. Excellent. Just I hear you. Oh, there we go. Can you hear me now? Yes. All right. So I think we can squeeze in one more question. If there's a class with another question, if you want to come up to the camera, uh, we'll get it in for you. And there we go. I can see Mrs. King's class. So I'll turn that on. Uh, there you go. Here, we're here. We're here. There you go. Um, I was wondering um, what. <laughs> this is a lot of pressure. Here we go. How many pizzly bears are left? Pizzly bears. So how many pizzly bears are there? How many pizzly bears? Well, we have two confirmed. Like I said, there's two confirmed pizzly bears, but we know that there must be one more because we have a mom that was a pizzly bear that we haven't seen. There's been another pizzly bear seen on one of the islands. Um, and then before that, there's been reports that they're unconfirmed of pizzly bears. So in terms of confirmed, we know that there are at least four pizzlies. All right, awesome. Well, first of all, I wanna thank our classrooms. It was so great uh, to have you joining in today with. Uh, amazing questions as always. I'll pop back into the Museum of Nature just quickly to make sure there isn't a, a last minute question, but it was great to have you guys joining us from Ottawa today. Thank you. All right. And Mark, of course, it was great to have you uh, joining us live today and, and sharing a little bit of your experience as well as your research. Thank you very much. It's been great. All right. So what I'll do is I will turn uh, the microphone's on, give the classrooms a chance to say goodbye and thank you, and then we'll sign out for today. So here we go, microphone's coming on. Bye. All right, always a rambunctious group of classrooms. Once again, Mark, thank yes. you so much. And we will be live thank from the you. Canada C3 on the 28th at one o'clock with some of the youth ambassadors. So tune in on YouTube for that. Um, again, thanks everyone, and we'll see you next time. Bye.